In Romans chapter 13 and 14, Paul continues to address the everyday life of a believer in relating to governing authorities, loving one another, walking in purity, respecting one another's preferences, and not doing things that become an offense or stumbling block to others. Several weeks we've been studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans. Today we will do Romans chapter 13 and 14. They're short chapters, so we will be able to cover them uh, quite easily. It's a very interesting journey uh, that Paul has been taking us through. Starting from, you know, chapter 1 where he addresses the whole issue of our sinfulness before God. Us having walked away from God. Uh, bringing us to an understanding of how we are justified by faith in Christ. Freely through the redemption that is in Jesus. That our sins are forgiven freely uh, because of what Christ did for us on the cross. Bringing us to this understanding that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we stand in grace before God. So he brings us to that place and then he begins to deal with some practical things of the Christian life. The first issue that Paul dealt with, which we saw in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, is the issue of overcoming sin. How do we, as believers, live a life that overcomes sin? And he addresses that in those three chapters, 6, 7, and 8, where he tells us, you know, the power of sin over our lives has been broken by Jesus on the cross. And uh, therefore, we can live victorious over sin. Sin will not have dominion over us. So let's say this together. Sin will not have dominion over me. So we've got to be absolutely convinced about that. That there is no sin that can dominate you because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus broke the power of sin. He set us free. Right? But then he says, in order for us to live victorious over sin, we have to walk yielded to the Holy Spirit. That's in Romans 8. If you walk in the Spirit, you will be able to crucify the sinful deeds of your body and you will live victorious. Then in chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul takes a little detour, if you will, to address this whole issue of what is God doing on the earth today as far as the church and the Jewish people are concerned. So in those three chapters, chapters 9, 10, 11, Paul lets us know that God in this season has opened the door to the Gentiles and he's getting us all in and then he's going to turn his attention back on the Jewish people. He's not given up on the Jewish people. He's, he's got a plan for them as well. So God is doing that right now. And then he gets back in chapter 12 to talking to us about our Christian life. How do we live our Christian life? Now, now that we are saved, now that God has set us free from the power of sin, now that we are in a right standing with God, we have righteousness by faith, how do we live our Christian life day to day? So last Sunday we went through chapter 12, just through some practical things. This is how you live Christian life. Today we're going to cover chapters 13 and 14. In these two chapters, Paul addresses five areas, five simple things as far as our Christian life is concerned. Our living together as God's people, as a community, five things. And I'll just mention these five and then we'll get into reading the scripture. The first thing he addresses is how do we as believers relate to the government, to governing authorities? You know, do we bless them, curse them? What do we do with them? You know? How do we relate to the government, firstly. Then he talks to us about, you know, relating to one another in love. He says, just keep that as a premise, a basic way how we relate to one another. Then he talks to us about walking in purity. These, these three things in chapter 13. In chapter 14, he deals with two other aspects. One is respecting each other's preferences. So we are all believers. We all love the Lord, but you know, we all have different tastes. We all have different preferences. And he, he admonishes us, he encourages us to learn to respect each other's preferences. He says, we have freedom. Each one of us have the freedom to have our own preferences, but also learn to respect each other's preferences. But at the end of that chapter 14, chapter 14, he says, in as much as we all have freedom to have our own preferences on various things, make sure 
that your freedom does not become a stumbling block or an offense to another believer. So use your freedom wisely, not to offend somebody else, not to cause somebody else to stumble in their faith and hinder their progress in faith. So these are the five areas we're going to talk about this morning. So let's start in Romans chapter 13. We'll read from verses 1 through 7 and then we will talk about governing authorities. Romans 13 verses 1 through 7. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs are due, to, to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now after reading this, you might think, surely he wasn't, he didn't know about our government. Or, you know. <laughs> now, let's get the context in which Paul was writing. This was somewhere around 80, 58, 54 to 68, you know, around that time, Paul was writing this episode. At that time, the Romans were ruling. That was the time of the Roman Empire. And the person in charge, the Roman Emperor, was Nero. And Nero was the worst of all the Roman emperors ever. Nero was a man who, you know, he, he went on this building spree to build a lot of things, a lot of buildings in Rome. And in order to do that, he raised taxes. He was also a man who was so, uh, you know, self-fulfilling. It is said that he burned part of Rome because he wanted to build, build bigger home for himself. He was so wicked, so oppressive, especially towards Christians, that he burned Christians as human torches to light his garden. That's Nero. And it's at that time Paul is writing. Be subject to governing authorities. Say, Paul, <laughs> please. <laughs> but that's the context in which he's writing this. All right? So let's try to understand this and also try to understand a little bit more about what scripture has to say as far as government, as far as people and authority. So, you know, here are some, some things that Paul mentions in this passage. He says, you know, we are to be subject to governing authorities in, honor to, uh, in order to honor God. He says all authority, uh, these authorities have been appointed by God. If we rebel against this, we are rebelling against the ordinance. So what ordinance means? Institution. Uh, if we are rebelling against an institution appointed or created or put in place by God. So he says, be careful. What are you doing against these authorities? And he says, you obey them in order uh, so that you don't get into trouble with them. You obey them uh, because they are an authority in place set by God. You obey them uh, just for your own conscience sake because your obedience to them is obedience towards God is what he says. And therefore he says, you pay your taxes, you, you know, pay the customs, you give reverence, you respect them uh, as unto God. How do we tie all this together? What are the important insights we need to take from this passage as well as the rest of what scripture says? And so I'm just going to quickly summarize and share some insights here. You know, especially, you know, what, in what sense are governing authorities appointed by God? And what about unjust, corrupt, wicked uh, uh, leaders 
uh, whether it was kings in times past or uh, presidents and ministers in, in our day. What about they, who are cut up? Those people are wicked. What about those who oppose Christians, who persecute Christians? Can we say that all these people are actually appointed by God? In what sense are they appointed by God? And how do we uh, relate to these kinds of uh, governing authorities and these are questions you and i uh, were definitely asked so let's consider these things the first point i want us to understand is that god himself has instituted governmental authority god is the ultimate authority and he has created authority structures in various aspects of life the very basic authority structure is the family where the husband is the head of the house you have authority structures like the government. You have author uh, 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 like the church. You have authority structures instituted by God like the workplace. You have your boss, your managers, your superiors, and uh, as well as the government. So all authority structures have been put in place by God with this intent that ultimately the person at the top directly submits to God and therefore becomes a channel of God's authority being dispersed through that authority structure. That's why, for instance, the Bible says, the husband or the man, you submit to Christ. That means you're ultimately submitting to God himself. And through you, God's authority must flow into that structure. The boss submits to God. Through him, God's government, or God's authority comes in to the workplace. The president the prime minister whoever is in charge of a nation submits to god and through that leader comes god's authority and god's government into that nation are you with me so in that sense all authority structure is from god all authority is submitted to god and through that god's own government is intended to flow into our lives so in that sense when we honor this structure, we are honoring God who put that structure in place. You may not agree with the person in that place, but that's besides the point. You're honoring what God has put in place. You're honoring the system. You're honoring the structure that God put in place. So that's one thing. Secondly, we must understand that uh, we recognize God's permission. In what sense is that leader appointed by God? In the sense that God has permitted that leader to be in that place. We do not, it is not necessarily that God dictates all that person says and does. God does not. That person in that authority will do whatever he chooses according to his own character, nature and decision and so on. But God has permitted that person to be in that place and we honor that. We recognize that. God has allowed it. Whether that person came in there through unlawful means, illegal means, through usurping authority, uh, back doorways, whatever. That person is there. God has permitted it. He's in that place. So I honor that structure and I honor God who designed authority in the first place. But we also understand this. For instance, you see many scriptures uh, along these lines. I've listed them in the notes. I may not necessarily uh, mention them here in the sermon. Uh, but uh, Psalm 75 says that God is the one who puts down one and raises the other. Daniel recognized that God removes kings and raises up kings. And Daniel 4.17, Daniel says, you know, the most high rules in the kingdom of men. And he gives it to whoever he wills. God is in charge. He permits people to come into their place. He allows that to happen. So in that sense, they are, quote unquote, a Appointed by God. They come into those places of authority. And you know, so even if somebody is there who is abusive of that power, we still honor that person because he's in that place. And Saul and David is a great example. Saul was chosen by God to be king, but then he went off the path. He became jealous. He wanted to kill David. He was oppressed by evil spirits. He was doing all kinds of wrong things. He actually went into a place of rebellion against God. Yet, David honors him. David honors him saying, He is the Lord's anointed. He's saying, see, this man is doing wrong. He's in rebellion. But I will not touch him. Because he is in that place. I will honor him. So what was David actually doing? He was honoring God by honoring the person in that place. Even though David realized the person in that place was doing wrong. He knew it. His own life was in danger. So that's a great example of how we honor the person in authority as unto God. But 
I mean, think about Pontius Pilate. You know, Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate. What did Jesus tell him in John 19 verse 10? You know, Pilate says, uh, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus tells him, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Okay, this is Jesus. Jesus, Pilate, don't you know whom you're talking to? <laughs> but he doesn't say that. He says, you could have no power unless it had been given to you from above. Now, Pilate was a Roman ruler. Not a good man. But Jesus still honors and recognizes this unsaved, ungodly man standing in this place. He says, still, I know where your authority comes from. God has permitted you to be in that place at this time. And I honor the Father. And I recognize what, what is happening. Right? So, uh, number three, the other thing we must also understand is that God will hold governments uh, responsible. In other words, you know, when we see people uh, who are in authority, whether it's in your workplace, your boss, your manager, you're the president of your company, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, if it is in some other authority structure, whether it's in government and so on, and they're abusive, they're misusing their position, they're doing wicked, uh, they are, uh, you know, persecuting God's people and so on. How does God see it? The Bible says this very clearly. Now, I'll quote just one verse in Proverbs 17, verse 15. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns, condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to God. God is watching and God isn't happy if they behave like that. So don't think that they're going to get away with it. God is watching. And all authority comes from God. God instituted the structures. He's going to do something about it sooner or later. So people in authority are eventually accountable to God. God sees it. He's going to step in. Also we understand that the Bible teaches us that the people of the land will get the government they deserve. So for instance, Proverbs 28 and verse 2 says, Because of the transgression of a land, many are its princes. That means if the land is full of evil and wickedness, they're going to have a huge turnover in the government. They're going to keep on changing. It's an unstable government. Unst there's going to be instability in their leadership. Many are its rulers. Why? Because of the transgressions of the land, the people. So people are not doing right. People are doing unrighteous. They're going to see that. Uh, uh, the result of that, even the kind of government, the kind of leadership that is over that nation. You're going to have people uh, coming in and out of p power. Uh, there's, the government is not going to be stable. The people are going to get the government they deserve. So the transgression, the sin of the people has an effect on the kind of persons uh, that come into place or places of power. And one more thing we need to understand is that God can steer the leaders for specific purposes. This is not to mean that every decision the leader makes is from God. But there are specific things that God can move upon the leader to do. So Proverbs 21 and word 21 verse 1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like rivers of water. He turns it wherever it takes. The, hand, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. God can steer it. And he often does this in response to the prayers of his people. We have examples of this. One uh, outstanding example would be that of King Cyrus, the Persian king. As soon as he came to power in the first year of his reign, he issued a decree. I mean, here's a Persian king who did not have any, you know, compassion on the Jews. But for some reason, as soon as he comes to power in the first year of his reign, he issues a decree saying, I, I, I allow, I permit all the Jews to go back to their land, to rebuild their city, to rebuild their temple. Just go back. You're free to do that. Why? You read the scriptures, you find God raised him up and God wanted that done. So he moved on his heart. God stirred the spirit of Cyrus to issue this decree. So God can still do that these days. In response to prayer, in response to our intercessions, he can move upon the heart of those in authority to do something specific that would at once God's purposes on the air. You would be so far? So, some other related questions that you and I would ask is, to what extent do we submit to governing authorities? And the answer is that we submit to governing authorities as long as they're aligned to the law of God. 
When the government wants us to do something that violates the law of God, that's when we have to take our stand and if need be, face the consequences. You find example, examples of this in Acts chapter, chapters 4 and also in Acts chapter 5 when the, the religious leaders of that day, they told the apostles, you should not preach in the name of Jesus. Their answer was very simple. You tell us, should we obey God or obey man? Whom should we obey? Right? So the commission from God is go preach the gospel. They're saying don't preach. Sorry, we have to preach. God has commanded us to preach. So there was civil disobedience, if you will, in this case, where they said we have to obey God, not man. But in all other cases, we are compliant to the laws of the land. We follow the laws of the land unless the law violates the law of God. Another related question is, should we not raise our voice, express concern, or stand against injustice and wickedness when we see it? So, if these people are appointed by God, and there is injustice, there is oppression, there is wickedness, should we just keep quiet, saying that they're, they're in their place because God has put them there? Or what should we do? I just might bring our attention to two scriptures, Proverbs 25 verse 5. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne will be established in... Righteousness. So if you see a wicked person influencing the leader, don't just sit down and say, oh God. No, it says do something. Take away the wicked person who is influencing the leader. Then things will happen in righteousness. Now how do you take away, not shoot him, but <laughs> how do you take away? Do what it takes. You know. Make sure a righteous person is elected into power. Make sure, you know, there are righteous people who can go and influence him. You know, in the right way, you bring righteous influence on the leader so that righteousness can be established in the land. But you've got to take action. Do something. Take away the wicked person from before the ruler. Do something to bring righteous influence around the ruler. Or, Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9. Open your mouth for the speechless. In the cause of all who are appointed to die, open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. In other words, when you see injustice, when you see oppression, when you see neglect, when you see that needs of people are not being addressed, what must we do? Raise your voice. Plead their case. Do something. Right? So, the answer to that question, what do we do if there is injustice or lack or neglect or lack of action? Do something. Raise your voice. Make it known. Plead their case. Take action. Are you with me? It's not that we should just remain silent uh, just because, oh, the government has been appointed by God and, 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 and so on. No, you raise your voice. Now, other things that Paul mentions here is he calls three times, he calls governing authorities, people in authority as ministers of God. Very interesting, it's the same Greek word deacon that is used to people who serve in church. So he's calling them as God's ministers. So we see something wonderful here, that people in government are called by the same name as people who serve in the church, God's ministers, deacons. So people are serving God. Which means that even in government, people in government have been given the opportunity by God to serve Him. It's a calling that God has for them. Now not everyone responds to the call, but it's a calling. You're God's ministers. Amen? So what a privilege. You can be a minister of God in church, you can be a minister of God in just that they, there they don't call them reverend. <laughs> in church they may call them this and that with different titles. But they are called God's ministers. So think about it. It's a calling. A godly calling. God is making available to people in government saying you are a minister of God in that place. And, and if they respond to that call, they are actually serving God in government. Amen? And he tells us that we submit to these authorities to receive their approval, approval to avoid punishment and also for conscience sake. And pay taxes, pay customs, give honor, give respect 
to the government. So that's how, as believers, we relate to the government. We pray for the government. We honor the government because we understand authority comes from God. Let's move on. Verses 8 through 10, Romans 13. He says, Owe no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love, there's no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And that's easy to understand. Basically, what Paul is telling us is, if you walk in love, you're keeping all the commandments. You're fulfilling the law. Just walk in love. Because if you walk in love towards your neighbor, you're not going to abuse them. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to murder them. You're not going to do any, none of these things you're going to do because you're walking in love. And says, so if you walk in love, you are fulfilling all of the commandments. So walk in love and see that yourself, that you owe no man anything except love. So when you see somebody, you say, I owe that person something. I owe that person only one thing. It is to love that person. It's a debt that I constantly owe people to love them right and he says that's the only debt that that you need to have see yourself loving people and if you do that you're keeping the law the last few verses of romans 13 verses 11 to 14 and do this that means you respect governing authorities you walk in love knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, that means decently, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and jealousy or envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill it lust. So this is a call to purity. He's saying... Awake. Don't be like somebody who is asleep. Just look at your neighbor. <laughs> Let's make sure. <laughs> right? It says, it's high time to awake. Because the night has already passed. So don't be like somebody. Don't live this Christian life as somebody who is in a deep slumber. Live this life as somebody who is wide awake. As in the day. And so when you... And he explains what, it, what he's trying to tell us. He says, so put off the, cast off the works of darkness. So you're in daytime, you're in daylight. Get rid of anything that has to do with darkness. And he mentions some of those things like strife and jealousy and uh, uh, immo sexual immorality, indecency. Um, he says, get drunkenness and so on. He says, get rid of all of these things. Because they belong to those who are living in the dark. You're not living in the dark. You're in the light. Get rid of these things. And he says, put on the armor of light. The armor of light is the armor of righteousness. You're getting rid of darkness. You're putting on light. You're getting rid of unrighteousness. You're putting on righteousness. Then he explains it to us here. Uh, to put on righteousness means you walk properly. You walk decently. You walk in a way that is honorable before God and man. And what is the best way to do that? Verse 14. Put on on the Lord Jesus Christ. Like it sums up everything. Put on Jesus Christ. Now that phrase put on was a common phrase used by Greek writers in those days. And uh, when somebody became someone's disciple and, and they embraced their ideas and teachings and principles and they were like really immersed in that doctrine and, and, and really decided to follow that person, they would say, I've put on. So you've put on Socrates. You've put on Pythagoras. you put on Plato. you put on. But here he's saying, you put on. So Jesus is just effusing out of you, everywhere you go. And you're clothed with Jesus. To the point uh, that you're so taken on with Jesus, to the point when people see you, they see Jesus Put on Christ. That's a call. That's, that's a challenge. Now, so when you and I pray and say, Lord, I want to be like Jesus. It's not arrogance. It's a command. So put on Jesus Christ. Be like Jesus Christ. So let's desire for that. Lord, wherever I go, I want people to see Jesus in me. Amen. And then he says in that same verse, Romans 13 verse 14. 
And make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh. That word provision is like to plan ahead of time to meet a need. So it's like this. You imagine morning when you leave home, you know that somewhere around 12 o'clock, or for some of us it's 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, you're going to feel hungry. So you pack your lunch. You make provision for your lunch ahead of time. So when that time comes, you're feeling hungry, you have your lunch. But now he says, don't do that. As when it comes to the sinful desires of your flesh. Don't make provision. That means you know ahead of time, your flesh is going to act up in a certain way. So what do you do? Preemptively, make sure the answer to that is going to be no. No flesh, you're not going to have it. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't give it an opportunity for its sinful desires to be satisfied. That means even beforehand, you're nailing it. Are you with me? So think about this. You know, I just, this may be a silly example. But let's say here's a guy who's, who's been an alcoholic. Here. Just the smell of alcohol would make him go and get a big thing. Whatever. This is an example. Right? <laughs> Sorry, I don't have all the details. <laughs> anyway. So he knows just the smell. So what should he do? He should preempt the smell. <laughs> just don't do it. Like, don't go in there. Don't put your place, put yourself in a place where you know you're going to fall. So don't do it. Don't put yourself in that situation. Make no provision for the flesh. Deny it even before it raises its ugly head. Is what he's saying. Make no provision for the flesh. So live like that. So think ahead of time. You know, uh, I, I, I'm going to go through my day today and uh, these things are going to happen. Hey, I got to be careful there because something is going to happen. You know, maybe some people are getting together and those people, uh, you know, they're going to do this. They're going to say this. I need to be careful. Make no provision for the flesh. Think ahead of time is what he's saying. So put on Jesus. Make no provision for the flesh. Let's go to chapter 14 and look at the next two um, uh, practical things that Paul deals with. Romans 14, verse 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. So he says, be very welcoming to somebody who is weak in the faith. Weak in the faith meaning somebody who is new to the faith. Somebody's new. They're not yet grounded. They don't know all the Christian names that we use. Uh, uh, they don't know all that. This is just new to the faith. So he says, you welcome, be very welcoming to such a person, but don't welcome him and start arguing with him about doubtful things. Don't do that. I mean, you start arguing with, hey, were you sprinkled or were you immersed? He's like, what is he talking about? <laughs> he's, he's new to the faith. He doesn't know about baptism and that the different ways of people, you know, the, the disputes that are there about how it's supposed to be done and all. He doesn't know all that. So don't receive him and start arguing here with him about these kinds of things. Right? Understand the person. And then he begins to explain a little further. He says, for one believes he may eat all things. That's most of us here. <laughs> but he who is weak eats only vegetables. I mean, that's his preference. Let him, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. In other words, you know, one person likes every, all kinds of food. One person has certain preferences. You know, don't think you're better than the other or don't look down on the other because of their preference. God has received both of us equally is what he's saying right verse 4 who are you to judge another servant to his own master he stands or falls indeed he will be made to stand for god is able to make him stand like why are you judging him just because he doesn't eat what you eat or things like that you know it's between him and god and god is able to take care of him this is what paul is saying verse 5 one person esteems one day above another another esteems every day alike 
Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. So again, in terms of days, people have preferences. You know, uh, for some people, hey, every day is the same. For some people, like this day is more, you know, I need to fast today. Uh, today I must not do this. Okay, they have some ideas on what they want to do. It says, look, you be fully, fully convinced in your own mind. About such matters, you do what you are convinced about. In verse 6, he who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. He who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. So basic thing is this. Hey, you respect each other's preferences. Don't judge that person just because you don't like their preference. They are accountable to God. We're all going to stand before God and give an account of what it is. First, you be convinced in your own mind. Don't judge the other brother knowing that we all have to stand before God and give an account to it. You see, some people like to come to church in shorts. Don't look. <laughs> now, for some of us, don't, everybody's turning there. No. <laughs> now, for some of us, even the thought of wearing jeans to church is sacrilegious. Forget about shorts. <laughs> That's like, hey, you're on the edge of hell. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so we automatically start judging people. How can that person come to church in shorts and he is a leader in the church? <laughs> you know, and so we start judging one another. Hey, it's just his preference. That's all. That has no, it is no indicator of his reverence or lack of reverence towards God. It's just his preference. So leave him alone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just picked this thing. But like this, there are so many other preferences that people have. You know, uh, whether it has to do with clothing uh, whether it has to do with food we eat, whether it has uh, certain other practices that we have. People, certain people have certain preferences. They like it a certain way. Fine. These do not this define our faith in God. Amen? So he's saying, just let it be. Let them have their own preference. Uh, it's between them and God. God will judge them. And if they are wrong, God will judge them. But there's really, you know, no big deal about these things. Don't argue. Don't get into disputes, especially be sensitive if somebody is new to the faith. Be sensitive because they may come with certain preferences. Don't start fighting over those things. Don't make that the issue. You with me so far? Then in the rest of the chapter, he says, look, we all have freedom. You all, each one be convinced in your own mind. You're free to make your choice. You're free to make your decision. But do it with sensitivity is what he addresses. Let's read from verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this or be settled with this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. That's what we should be looking at. Look, is my freedom in any way offending another brother or causing him to fall? Stumble means you, you trip him up so he can't continue in his journey of faith. That's what you've got to be looking at. That's what you've got to be concerned about. Verse 14, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus Christ that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So it's again the issue of food. Paul says, hey, uh, everything is fine. You just pray over it, you bless it, you eat it, uh, and, and go on. Yet, verse 15, yet if your brother is greed because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. 
Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. So if there is such a situation where a brother is actually caused to stumble in his faith, then be careful. Then you make sure that you hold back on your freedom, at least when you are in his presence, so that he doesn't have to fall. That's the idea. You're being sensitive to his preference, and especially if it's going to hurt his faith. It's not that, okay, you know, you know we all, maybe we all set a table, table to have food. Some may be pr maybe vegetarian. Uh, some may just eat, you know, certain kinds of meats, and some may eat everything. Okay, we, as long as we're not offending each other in faith, that's fine. But if there's such a, a situation where a person's faith is on the line, that's when you pull back on your freedom. Are you with me? Right? That's when we be careful. Verse 16, he says, uh, Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So in the kingdom of God, there are things that are more important than eating and drinking. It is pursuing righteousness, peace, joy. Those things are more important. Let's pursue those things uh, rather than uh, matters of eating and drinking. Verse 18 on. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by, by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. So if it's going to cause a brother to stumble, offend, or weaken in his faith, then when that's when you hold back on your freedom. But verse 22, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. So you approve eating, you enjoy it privately between you and God, you enjoy your eating. But if you're in the presence of a brother who may be offended, who may be caused to stumble, who may uh, be weakened in his faith, then hold back on your freedom in his presence. Verse 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because who does not eat from faith for whatever is not from faith is sin. So if, if you eat in a manner that, is, uh, that you feel condemned, hey, I know I'm actually offending this brother, but I'm still going to eat. Means you know you're intentionally offending him. Or if you're e eating it in a doubtful manner, I, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if I should do this or not, and so on. It says, then, then back off. What do you do? Do it being convinced. Do it in faith. Right? Uh, now, this whole issue of eating may not be so relevant. I mean, I'm trying, you know, uh, uh, in relevant in our context. Uh, if you run into a situation where it is, then remember what Paul instructed us in Romans 14. That in the presence of somebody who may be offended because of your food, who may be caused to stumble, or who may become weak, then you hold back. I'll just share one example. Uh, this happened, I think, last year, year before I forget. You know, there was a person who had been recommended to us to come and preach in our church um, uh, overseas, from overseas. Right, and uh, because he was recommended by somebody else, I said, sure, you come, preach, and since you're here that week, and he's coming all the way from America, I said, you preach in our church, fine, and that following Wednesday is our pastor's meeting, we host a monthly pastor's meeting for pastors in Bangalore, uh, so you can also speak at the pastor's meeting, so you're welcome to do that, uh, and I sent his name off to our media team to, you know, to do the announcement and inform people out. So the media team, very diligently, they look him up online, the first video is him sitting in his wine cellar, Drinking wine, promoting a book. The media team got shocked. <laughs> what? Who is pastor inviting? <laughs> is he the right person? So they came back. Pastor, this is the video we saw. Uh, and this is the person who's coming to preach in APC. You know? <laughs> so I got, oh, what do we do now? This is a little too late because, you know, everything has been, we've said yes to everything. And... Uh, uh, you know, of course, all of our people are online. They'll just go look him up online. First video comes up. <laughs> sitting in a wine cellar, drinking wine, promoting his Christian book. <laughs> what are they going to think about us? You know, it's like, okay, this is a very tight situation now. How do, what do we do? Right? Plus, we told him to speak to the pastors. So, <laughs> imagine, you know, this email goes to about 800 pastors in Bangalore. They're all going to see Pastor Ashes has invited, a, you know. Oh man, what, what do we do here? This is a touchy situation. 
Ah. Because as a policy for us as leaders, it's zero wine. So none of our pastors and church, our, our understanding between us, we don't drink wine. No, that's it. We stay away from it. Uh, but we know that, you know, uh, around the world, not everybody looks at it the same way. There are preachers and pastors around the world. For them, wine is, you know, they drink wine with every breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know? <laughs> it's their choice, you know. So that's the way they do it. But for us, it's different. So I had to write to this person. I said, you know, please, I, I, I hope you'll understand our context. You're coming all the way. I just need to let you know. I don't want to be answering emails from people as, you know, I don't want to get into this situation. People are going to ask. Definitely they will ask because they will definitely look you up online and this is the video they're going to see, the first video. <laughs> and they will ask. Pastors in the city will ask me the question, why did you invite such a person? You know, because our context is different. It may be okay there, but here it could be totally misunderstood and so on. So I said, for if you don't mind, could you please take it off? But I had to state this. If you don't take it off, I will need to cancel the meetings. Yeah. I had to say it because I don't want to be spending time answering that question when we have more important things to do. Right? So I had to state that because our context is a little different. And thank God it worked out. I don't know if the video is back up now. <laughs> I haven't gone and checked. But... At least at that time, he was gracious. And I said, okay, I understand where you're coming from. And he took that off, put it off. That doesn't mean he cleared up his cellar. That's his choice. But when he comes into our context, be sensitive and so on. You know, so that was, we also told him some of the other, other things. Don't, please don't talk about when you're here because our context is different. And so on. And he was very respectful uh, to that, uh, that we had made a request. So I'm just thinking of some examples like that, you know, where... Uh, 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 where people could get offended. You have freedom to make your choice. But when you get into their context, their world, you need to also be respectful of uh, whether you'll offend them, uh, whether you might cause them to stumble in their faith, or you may cause them to weaken in their faith. You have to be a little respectful uh, and make those uh, changes. Even though you have freedom to do what you want to do between you and God, that's, that's, that's fine. Are you with me? So even as a Christian community, as we interact with each other, serve each other, bless each other, just be respectful of each other's preferences. And if something you're doing is going to hurt somebody else, then, hey, you pull back in that situation and, and just be a blessing uh, to the other person. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. Let's take a few moments to pray before we close. I just want to, I want you to pray just about these five things that we Paul addressed, areas of our life. In our relating to government, let's Make it a choice to respect the government, to pray for them, bless them. In our walking in love, when we walk in love, we fulfill the law. In our walking in purity, put on Christ, make no provision for the flesh. In our respecting each other's preferences, maybe there are people around you that you need to just say, God, I respect their preference, their choice. That's fine. I respect it. I may not agree with it, but it's okay. It's their preference. My preference or my taste may be different. And lastly, that our, we use our freedom wisely. That we do not want to offend, we do not want to weaken or cause any other believer to stumble in the exercise of our freedom. Father, we thank you for your word, for the instruction of your word. I pray that by your spirit, God, these truths will mold and shape our lives. The way we live as believers, as a community, how we relate to one another, that will shape our lives by your spirit. And may we, each one of us, put on the Lord Jesus Christ so that Jesus is seen through our lives. Everywhere we go, let Christ be seen. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website, apcwo.org, for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.